me. Um, I'm Jeremy Lent. I'm a research fellow here in IDS in the vulnerability and poverty team. And uh, I think I heard someone say earlier describing this as a treat, which it, it certainly is. Um, I'm delighted to um, have uh, Jeremy Swift as well as Muhammad Ali and Izzy Birch for us today for the seminar. Um, Jeremy, of course, many of you know, is a dear friend of, of IDS and uh, was at IDS for 20 odd years. Um, and of course, uh, many of you will be familiar with his work. He's worked on dry and pastoralism, both in the Horn of Africa and West Africa for a very long time. And so um, I'm delighted to welcome Jeremy back to IDS. Um, and thanks very much for coming today. Thank you, thank you, Jeremy. Um, Anybody who's followed the events in, in Kenya, in the dry lands of Kenya in the last few years will know that there have been some extremely exciting things happening. And um, we're extremely lucky and I'm very pleased to be here and very honoured to be introducing Mohamed Elmi and Izzy Birch uh, with a, what is a very unusual paper. It's an insider's look at, at, at policy change, which I think I don't know very many examples. And, and as I say, there are two of the architects of this change are here in the room. Uh, Mohamed Elmi is uh, I first knew him 30 years ago. Working on, he was working on primary health care in northern Kenya. And from there he, he rose seamlessly through being Oxfam regional manager for, for, for East Africa to being minister with, I think, with the best ministerial title that I've come across in the entire world so far, which was Minister for Kenya and Other Arid Lands. <laughs> um, which had that acronym, which was even longer, I think. Um, it, it, that was in the years 2008 to 2013, and he's now gone back to being what he politely calls an ordinary MP, but I think will be a very great force for, 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 the, for the better in Northern Kenya. And Izzy Birch, who was with uh, Oxfam, mainly in East Africa, for about 18 years, she, for the last five years, has been working in the ministry uh, as, as Mohammed's assistant. And she now works at uh, NADIMA, the Drylands Agency, the Black Drylands Authority that's been set up to carry forward uh, government governance on Kenya's, Kenya's drylands. I think what we're going to do, if I understand right, is 20 minutes of Izzy and 20 minutes of, of Mohammed, and then we'll have a general discussion. Uh, so please, Izzy. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I will probably speak for slightly less than, uh, than 20 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, and I'm going to talk first about the context, so the background to the creation of the ministry, and then Mohammed's going to talk in more depth about some of the choices the ministry made, some of the results, and some reflections of that. I think I can just about reach. <laughs> yes. Um, so the, the paper that we've written is a reflection on the work of the ministry over the last five years. The ministry was created in April 2008 as part of the coalition government that, that settled the post-election violence in Kenya. It ended in March 2013 with the new administration that's just come into place. So we're talking about a five-year period, and we're talking about reflections that are very recent, um, just in the last few months. Uh, so one of the reasons why we wanted to write the paper was, was for continuity. And I'll explain later on why that's mattered in Kenya, that there's been a marked lack of institutional continuity in the way that government has dealt with the drylands. So one of the reasons for writing the paper is to, to smooth the transition between administrations. Uh, a second reason is about sharing lessons, that we feel it's unusual to have a ministry specifically for drylands. It's unusual to have a ministry for a marginalized part of the country, uh, and there may be lessons there of interest to others. It's also perhaps unusual to have reflections written by people from within government who've been involved in government, as opposed to people outside commenting on government. So again, we hope that might be of some interest. A third reason for writing the paper is public accountability, to contribute to the culture of accountability in Kenya, so that Kenyans can, can read and see the choices the ministry made and the reasons why it did that. And then fourthly, to contribute to, to future debate. Um, before I go any further, we would like to thank Future Agriculture's Consortium for making the reflection possible. It's been, a, if this is a treat, we had a treat <laughs> writing it as well. So thank you, Jeremy and Ian and your colleagues in Nairobi who've been a great help. 
so I think I've explained the structure of the presentation. I'll briefly cover the context, and then Mohammed will go look in more depth at the, the rest of the agenda. I need a longer arm. Uh, so briefly, uh, there may be many people here who know Kenya, but for those whose specialism is elsewhere, just a few brief uh, remarks on the often called the Asals, the arid and semi-arid lands of Kenya, the dry lands of Kenya, which as you can see make up 85% of the country. It's a very large part of the landmass and a little over a third of the population. And the minister's mandate covered all of the Asals, the arid and the semi-arid, which is shaded slightly differently. But our paper focuses um, in more detail on pastoral issues because that tends to be the area of greatest contestation and misunderstanding. So a little bit of context as to why the ministry was created and why there is a need for this more focused policy attention on, on pastoral areas in Kenya. And we have to go right back to the colonial era, as, as often, to the model of political economy uh, put in place by the colonial state. So the classic example of a railway built from the coast to the interior to extract resources, and development grows up around that railway. So infrastructure and services grow up around that, and the hinterland is left relatively marginalized. And that pattern has been sustained by the post-colonial administrations as well. So there has been a continuity between colonial and post-colonial uh, administrations. And when we talk about public investment, it's not just the money, it's also the government's own resources, so personnel, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the distribution of, of government's resources. And more recently, what you've seen in Kenya is a preference for um, what is called equal treatment. So every constituency receiving the same resources. That, that seemed to be, in inverted commas, equitable. And of course it's not, because it's being overlaid on this underlying inequality. I think a second factor is around the way pastoral areas are framed, um, which again is common to many countries in, in Africa and elsewhere with significant pastoral populations that they tend to be framed as a problem, and again, this started in the colonial area, with uh, a sort of narrative of containment and a concern with security, uh, with, with controlling livestock movement, with the movement of livestock into the, the White Highlands. And again, that has been sustained into the post-colonial period. As a result, national policy is, if you like, insufficiently nuanced to different ecologies and production systems. Kenya is a very rich and diverse country in terms of its production systems, its cultures, its social systems. But you perhaps wouldn't know that by looking at the way uh, government works in a very, fairly monolithic and uh, homogeneous way. If you look at administrative procedures, again, uh, a very good example is uh, education, where a few years ago, um, a civil servant in the Ministry of Education decided that all children who had, were coming up to the end of their primary education uh, needed a birth certificate to be able to sit their exams. Well, for most children in remote, arid counties, documentation is a real issue. There's perhaps only one place you can go to get a birth certificate. Perhaps your father didn't even want you to go to school in the first place. There's no incentive to go and get one. So policy makers in the capital will issue directives and develop procedures which just don't work for the, for the whole of the country. As a result of this, you get a sense of, of two Kenyas. You get a sense of a, a highland Kenya, an agricultural Kenya, a settled Kenya, and then you get a, a dryland Kenya where people are mobile, where population density is much lower, where there's a sense of grievance of being left out of, of the national development. Uh, and, uh, and the two don't understand each other. So the highland Kenya, the, the Kenya from Nairobi, wants to change. Dryland Kenya to become more like itself, uh, and, uh, and so on. So that's, that's, those are some of the issues that have informed um, pastoral development and policy making in Kenya. The consequences, very high levels of inequality. And you could take almost any indicator you choose. We've just taken three. Uh, so the percentage of girls out of school, minimal in Nairobi, of course, very high. In somewhere like northeastern province, which is a very, very large province, uh, very undeveloped in terms of infrastructure and services. Um, human development index, twice as high in a county like Nyeri, which is very close to Nairobi, as Turkana, which is a very remote county up on the, the Sudanese border. 
And then the third example, adult literacy. So both in terms of outcome and opportunity, uh, adult literacy a fraction in Mandera, again a remote county up on the Ethiopia-Somali border, uh, compared with somewhere like Kiambu, which is again very close to Nairobi. But the issue is not just the, the level of adult literacy, but look where the adult literacy teachers are. They're not in the places where you have the highest levels of illiteracy. They're in the places where it's easier to work. Um, so again, this is an example of government, the bias in the distribution of government investment. So despite that, it's not that government didn't realize there was a problem, and has tried various things since the 1980s. Um, and this diagram just shows the different things which have been tried since the 1980s. So down the left-hand column, three different uh, options, institutional options. A full ministry, which is, is what we've had for the last five years, or a department for dry lands or arid lands within a ministry, or a project. And the point I was making at the beginning about the lack of continuity. So in the 1980s, you have a department, and it's there for quite a long time. It's largely a vehicle to deliver donor projects. That's what it was. There were some very large-scale donor projects at the time, and that was done through that department. And then that stops. And then you get something else. You get a full ministry. But that lasts for four years. And then you get a project, which has a completely different way of working. And then you get our ministry, which came in in 2008. And what happens is that every time these institutions change, Kenyans love writing policy, writing strategy. Um, every new institution that comes in develops another policy and another strategy. Even that project, which lasted for a long time, moved between three, between three different ministries. So every time it moves ministry, it has to negotiate with the new minister and permanent secretary. So there's been no stability. And if you think of the background, these are systemic they're generational challenges in terms of inequality, chronic poverty. They're not going to be resolved in a five-year government term. So Mohammed will explain why, why this, this directly informs some of the choices that he made as minister. So finally, I'm just going to highlight a few things. So if we come up to 2008 when the ministry was created, what were some of the things going on in Kenya at the time which really supported um, the creation of the ministry. I mentioned the post-election violence. Inequality had really moved up the political agenda. So for those of you who, who watched the, that transition, uh, the post-election, the, the agreement that ended the, the post-election violence had several components, one of which was looking at long-term issues and solutions. That was agenda four. And our ministry was, was part of that. So inequality was a much more salient and topical issue outside government, pastoral civil society had really developed. So from the 1980s, 1990s, as a, as a result of a lot of NGO work on empowerment, uh, people were much more aware of their rights, of their place as citizens. Um, so you had a movement from outside government as well, saying, uh, making a claim, if you like, on the state, such that in the 2007 elections, political parties had to respond, and they included things like livestock insurance and their manifestos. And then the big one, this search for a new constitution. Again, for those of you who know Kenyan politics, this was on the table for a long time. Uh, but again, a sense that Kenya's institutions generally were not working and had to be overhauled. Um, so, so that bigger dimension, again, was a tremendous support to the minister's agenda. And then two things that happened later, this whole language around resilience, which I put in inverted commas, um, but this, this uh, bringing together, if you like, of, of concerns about uh, short-term uh, risk with long-term vulnerability. Uh, that proved helpful for the ministry because it, it brought together the, the humanitarian agenda with the long-term agenda, which we found very helpful. And then lastly, the African Union policy framework on pastoralism, which was Jeremy and others worked on that for a very long time, very progressive. So once Kenya had signed up to that at the African Union level, that, that gave us strong support. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to Mohammed, who's going to talk in more detail about uh, what the ministry did and why. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. I think we easily have the background. I also want to thank the German group for uh, making this possible. And you can't believe the opportunities now made available. So, in the other, not next week, the other week, we will present in more detail 
this to all the governors and newly elected senators. So it's highly <coughs> other spin off. So with this background, what were then the policy choices we made? And I want to say it wasn't immediate. So it's like I've been in the, I come from the area, been in the development of those areas for a long time. And therefore, what would you do with the ministry? Knowing that there was another ministry before, and for years. And so how do we rebalance that um, in terms of the project? The incentives, as Isia said, is you come and you do projects and the expectation for deliverable type uh, projects. Everybody expects you to do that. And we have to do them. But uh, again, what happens then? It's not Northern Kenya or the other lands who are not, or uh, did not lack big projects. But then nothing changed. Uh, and therefore, and the, the demand for things which are visible. We recognize that this are different kind of ministry. The policy, our mandate was very clear that we coordinate policy across government and it listed a whole range of areas. But how do you do that, you know, in a way that, and um, the president's statement in when he made it is to address the uniqueness in this area. So we ask ourselves, for education, what's unique? For roads, what's unique? So education, we had 700 to 1 million children out of school because they are mobile. <coughs> for Ministry of Health, how do they work in a sparsely populated and how do they pose? So we had those different engagements with those people. But I, I think for me, they, they, they focus on what we call in Kenya foundations. Mm -hmm. There is a, a Vision 2030 policy document that every successive government is expected to work to. Uh, mentions uh, foundations, which is roads, you know, infrastructure. For me, as somebody who has been in development for a long time, it became much more clear, maybe a year or two into the time, that every production system requires a minimum foundations to be available, whether you are growing coffee or you are growing cells. So really that, again, shifted the way we thought about it. So that pastoralism is as profitable as coffee or any other, but it requires access roads, it requires water to be available, educated uh, workforce for it to compete. So for me, that was a major change in terms of how do you do that? So, <coughs> so we thought we'll then to explain to others, you know, work in different ways as a ministry. So real coordination, engaging ministry, trying to understand <coughs> what they're supposed to do and what what is unique in this area that they do different. I gave an example of Minister Bell. This worked different with the different ministries. Uh, in different ways, depending on the minister or the permanent secretary in place and how they understood. So I'll give an example of the Minister for Energy. We thought it's a good idea and we have a few twice a year meeting with all the districts from the area. And most of the districts now have electricity, all the district water because set aside additional money uh, in the commission. Uh, of Education. So depending on who you engaged. Uh, projects, we saw any projects we did as either gap filling, meaning any additional schools you built had significant change in the area, so it was good to, to, to do that. Do some projects, and we couldn't do any. Uh, one of them, I might have to them here, to try to show new approaches. Issues not picked by others, like government. We had another one which we are calling one Kenya. How do you change the attitudes? And later I'll talk about how that was probably one of the big challenges to really change. The other one is uh, on policy and legal and institutional framework. I think that one where we really thought through and with support of BFI had a complete consultancy done. The ASAL uh, policy, which was now, and 10 years of trying to get a policy. Uh, we might have that. Legal reforms which again, we were very lucky, and listed all the acts of parliament that have changed. Then we had the new constitution just coming and 
through a majority of those out. Then the institutional framework that will try to look and sort out all those uh, things. Regional interaction has been seriously probably the best pan Africans. They don't organize borders and all that. Uh, we thought we should engage the nearby countries. Again, with a limited success, we had a discussion with Rwanda, Ethiopia, uh, a few of that, largely around peace. And we, so the, the choice, again, trying to rebalance integration uh, and specialism. So if you use the gender terminology of trying to mainstream uh, against each one of them. So the, the issue of pastoral areas like other areas should be this was built of the main ministers, which actually is something we believe. But then that is against do they actually know the uniqueness of those areas and what will happen? The separate, a separate ministry is not the best solution, but again, it puts us on the table. So I was able to walk to every ministry, find out where specific policies are reached. So, for example, in of education, we needed a nomadic education council which will focus as an institution on nomadic children. And that was only possible because I worked in my colleague's office, we call all his staff, and they told to go and draft the legislation. And the Minister of Education, a uh, very good man, this guy says, uh, you know, he, he pushed it through parliament. You know, so that. If it was not a ministry, then that would not have been possible. Those ideas were on the table for a long time. But the fact that we had a ministry, and uh, then it was able to push. So it's a give and take. Uh, then uh, the, the government and the whole uh, aid system is organized around sectors. So really big problem trying to put it uh, as a geographical ministry. So this ministry was among the group of ministries that are under agriculture. On ten ministers, we are very many ministers. So really, how do you then balance the two? The recommendation after long consultation was what we came up with, um, which tries to combine both integration and specialty. So up there, the new institutional framework is an ASAL um, cabinet subcommittee which is uh, the session of the command is the president of the deputy chairs. And therefore, making sure each of the ministries achieve what is expected of them. Again, a model we, we, we did quite a bit of looking at other countries. Turkey, uh, some sort of that model where the NATO which was back, and the, the prime minister himself chairs the meeting uh, for them to meet their targets. We needed somebody more senior to order them. And they, then you have the permanent specialist and permanent uh, institutions uh, dealing with the specialist site, which is here. And basically, the, the ASAL secretariat becoming the blue. And the stakeholder forum, uh, where everybody has come together trying to bring both issues together. So, what about the results? <laughs> Uh, this is just to let you know there are three documents. Uh, so, National Policy on Sustainable Development of Northern Kenya and Ireland, that's a session of paper. And the other one is the development uh, strategy. Basically, looking at the vision that the country had and looking at what would be the gaps within it for the Ireland. And the other one is ending the automobiles. It's uh, what is it say, the project change to look at resilience in a different way. So, as a result of the uh, session paper, all these institutions were passed as part of the things that are required. Again, this is just for general knowledge of who might want to deal with can. So, a, a sub cabinet committee has been constituted. I'm mm -hmm. hoping the new government again, when the new ministers are constituted, to start again. The ASAL Secretariat, which is to, to service all the other institutions, that one plus the ASAL uh, Stakeholders Forum. The National Drought Management Authority, again, is a, is something that will do a whole range of continuity that was not possible before. Uh, 
the industrial marketing board. Uh, maybe this uh, at this point I mentioned why I thought you know all other institutions, uh, no production systems in Kenya seem to have that the task of the have. I would I'd like to use coffee. The coffee farmers in Kenya are organized in cooperatives. The, all the coffee farms have, you know, a common maybe factory where they deliver their, their produce. Access roads for them to be able to do that. And they have coffee research that keeps looking at if the coffee is developing diseases and changes that. But they also have credit line, which really the government writes off uh, when something goes wrong, maybe the frost or something. And when for livestock, you don't have any of that. And therefore, subsidize. All those things I'm talking about are government entities that are employees. So government subsidizes that one production. Uh, but with the livestock, no. Apart from the Department of Livestock within the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock, it's nothing else. So, pastures are highly subsidized, but through maize, you know, through emergencies, not, not through long term. So, the idea was then to do the same for livestock, and that's why we have to work on board as one of the things that went into that. Uh, when I asked one of my colleagues who comes, all constituencies <coughs> uh, coffee. She said, I said, if you removed all those, what will happen? Said, Within a season, we'll either put it or you have to do as much. So, basically, what I'm saying is, and that's only one crop. Saiso has the same, Aredran has the same, uh, you know, they, all the, and yet livestock contributes to half of our, almost half of the GDP with very little support. So, that's, it is a good, uh, process to go through. So the last one, the nomadic uh, education I talked about, uh, we thought of having two institutions that are largely private sector, Northern Cage Education Trust, which is meant to take more women to investing, and Northern Kenya Investment Fund, which we thought should be set up as a private entity to encourage businesses to go to those areas. So, in terms of the reflections, progress in policy and institutional reform was due to really a network of individuals. So, a number of us who are already existing uh, in the system, you know, work together. But again, the question is, you know, will this work in today's period? Uh, a number of them are like the Senate, the Speaker of the Senate is with the Chair of the uh, Pastoral Parliamentary Group. So we think we have enough individuals. But then the next thing is the tension. We want the institutions really to function rather than depend on the goodwill of individuals who come in and turn out. And therefore, how would we make that happen? The tendency to view the islands in terms of the ecology and production system rather than policy. I think that cuts across its government, it's, uh, the, the donors and everybody. Again, how do we make sure that that changes? For example, we had to look, we, the people who engaged this ministry were the people they like it, even if they the donors or the NGOs, rather than the infrastructure. We had to go looking for them, or education, we had to look for them. Uh, they were not part of, the ministry was part of the agricultural ministry, it's rather than the other. Yet, the development of other lands is, is the whole spectrum is the economy and everything else. Uh, never social pillar or the political pillar. So the real reason, therefore, for this paper is to go beyond individuals. How do you make sure that... Uh, that uh, this continue to happen, and those institutions that we talked about actually work. I'm sorry, I forgot to do this bit. So, blockages to progress are not necessarily because of apathy or indifference to passive. I think that's really another thing that came in. It could be just a lot of shortcoming of, uh, 
although we call small things, but really a lot of things that happen with the government. Inability to distribute resources within, uh, in certain ways. Um, we control and accountability, so individuals can decide this project was here, and this goes here, without really thinking through what damage it to do to pass through the uh, way it is going. The real the need of civil service reform is, is much wider. They end at small but mundane things like end and the start of a new financial year. So if you get a drought coming around May, as it had happened in 2001, the systems can't cope. That's why one of the reasons of creating this drought fund authority was an institution then that can carry its money forward. So things like that can really, and I tried to mention to my colleagues when we met in May, saying, look, this child is going to bite. And when we go into the next financial year, nothing will, money will not be available until August. People thought that was crazy. But I accepted that happened. And one of the reasons the response was not particularly good. The broader policy, uh, it's good to mention, and I think he's mentioned, the broader policy environment was good. It was a year when there was no opposition. So there was a coalition government mandated to do specific reforms in order to, to take the country forward. And we had a president who really put space. So if you're a minister, you never made a call, phone call to say, don't do this or do that. So really people got on with it and, and did that. But another challenge, in my view, that uh, was then uh, there at that particular time, is, which is linked to the first, the fourth one, that we had this real attitude where people thought, you know, one of our mandates actually, uh, and I saw who wrote that day, you know, let's develop settlements along the road and let's get passes to settle them. So to get over that, to agree to these institutions, so people are really assistant to these new institutions and uh, the government. And the most frustrating thing would be when then you feel you can't convince them and somebody's junior to you, but actually they seem to hold power, they seem to be the government. So that was uh, uh, one of those frustrating periods. But eventually we got over that one. The devolution uh, gives a significant uh, potential with the new governors, clear money being uh, devolved, particularly but, uh, what are the risks within it. Already there are conflicts quite a bit, a number of them. Mm -hmm. Because the clients now have their little government they contribute to the tradition of rights. This will be the end. Parliament now has more critical role. Uh, we call presidential system, so we can hold the executive to account for implementation of most of these policies. But <coughs> then we'll see how well we do with it. Uh, will integration bring new challenges to pastoralism? For example, alienation of land, exploitation, and an inappropriate investment. That's the question in the middle. Once you open it up and the rules go in and you get the things I've been asking for, uh, which is the minimum rules, electricity, everything, what else would they bring to the process? Thank you very much. <laughs>